Hi. Good. Okay, so Professor Bartram gave a very wonderful presentation just about generally overall kind of giving you a really good introduction into Miranda rights and the history of it and the expansion and um, you know some of the limitations that have happened through the years and what I'm going to focus on right now is really what are your rights? Um, how does this work in action? Um, you know what do you do when you interact with the police? Um, when does your Miranda right attach? What can you say? And all that kind of um, just very practical stuff for you to use and know. Um, so I guess I'll just kind of give a quick introduction. Um, Shelley said, you know, I am uh, the legal director for the ACLU of Nevada, and the ACLU of Nevada is a affiliate of the larger ACLU organization. Um, we are a nationwide nonprofit, a nonpartisan organization. We're dedicated to protecting the civil liberties and civil rights of uh, all people and protecting people's rights based on the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the laws of the United States. And Professor Bartram kind of uh, mentioned this quickly in his presentation, but actually um, the ACLU of Arizona, which is also an affiliate of the larger ACLU, um, was the, were the attorneys who were instrumental in representing Miranda at the Supreme Court and getting a firm, a local firm in Arizona to uh, represent him and so we're really this is a, a very important thing for the ACLU as well um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today are what what are your Miranda rights um, when do you have to be informed of your Miranda rights um, how can you waive these rights how can you invoke these rights what are the consequences when you are not informed of your Miranda rights and you're supposed to be uh, what are your Miranda rights in school and other important constitutional rights for students to know. Um, and just to give you a brief overview, the constitutional foundations, it's really rooted, uh, Miranda rights are rooted in two really important um, aspects of the Constitution. Uh, the first one is the Fifth Amendment. Does anyone know what the Fifth Amendment is? I see some heads shaking us. Shout it out. Right to grand jury uh, so, so the Fifth Amendment in this context is the right against self-incrimination. So we're really, <laughs> it's okay, we're all just learning today. Um, so, <laughs> that's why we're here learning today, it's okay. No, no, that's great. Um, so the right against self-incrimination means that you don't have to be compelled to say something that's going to send you to jail. Um, and so this is kind of one of the uh, constitutional rights that the Miranda warnings grew out of. And another really important one is your Sixth Amendment right. And Sixth Amendment right is what? Raise your hand if you know and I'll call in. Yes, you don't have to shout out. Does anyone want to volunteer? There's like six of them. What's, what's the Sixth Amendment right in this context of Miranda? What do you guys think? Absolutely. There you go. Exactly. Say you redeemed yourself. Good job. <laughs> Um, so these are the really two important rights uh, that Miranda uh, focuses around. Your right against self-incrimination and your right um, to an attorney. And really what, you're con what the courts are concerned about um, is the voluntariness of a confession, um, whether you are being coerced by the police and um, you, know, you have the right to um, an attorney and the right to not uh, incriminate yourself and we want to really make sure we're protecting those so everybody knows the Miranda rights right we know all you know exactly like Professor Bartram was saying they're on TV all the time but we'll just go through them quickly and talk about them um, for and uh, they're a little bit different for adults than they are for juveniles so for adults you have the right to remain silent anything you say can and use uh, be used against you in a court of law you have the right to an attorney. If you can't afford an attorney, one will be appointed uh, before questioning. Very important. Um, and asking, do you understand these rights? And in Nevada, uh, you're supposed to also say that, you know, kind of as a play on um, if you can't afford an attorney, that they have no way of giving you a lawyer, but one will be appointed for you if you wish, um, when you, if and when you go to court. And so that's kind of the basic overview of the rights that are supposed to be explained to you. Um, under the Miranda requirements. For juveniles, um, it's a little bit different. Juveniles um, is anyone who's uh, under 18 and you're charged with a crime as a juvenile. 
So you're supposed to also hear from uh, the police um, that your statements can be used against you in juvenile or adult court. So if you're um, arrested as a juvenile, you need to be told that um, these statements can be also used against you in adult court. And what do you guys think? Do you think your parents have to be there during questioning? Let's say you get arrested and the police take you to the station. Do you think the police have to wait for your parents? No, they don't. Um, but the police do have to inform your parents. So um, it's a state requirement that they have to call and they have to tell them if they can. Um, but they don't have to wait for them and they don't have to include them in the questioning even if you are a juvenile. Um, but it really does make a difference if your parents are there when we're talking about whether um, a confession or a statement to the police is voluntary or not. So courts are really going to look at um, how juveniles were treated as to whether um, this was a voluntary confession. They're going to look at um, evidence of physical or psychological coercion and indications um, <clears throat> that you actually understood the Miranda warnings. So do you guys think that when the police arrest you, they have to say the Miranda warnings word for word? Do they have to say it exactly? No, right? So let's say you get arrested um, and they say it a little bit differently than like what you heard on TV. That doesn't mean that your confession is going to be thrown out. Um, all they really have to say is, um, you know, they've got to just send the message of it, right? That you have the right to an attorney, that you um, have the right to be silent, and that you understand these rights. So, when do you guys think a Miranda warning is required? I'm going to give you a couple of options, and we're going to vote, okay? So, is a Miranda warning required, A, anytime a police officer talks to you, B, as soon as you're arrested, C, before or as soon as you arrive at the police station, D, before a police officer interrogates you, or E, before a cop interrogates you and you are not free to leave? Okay. So who thinks it's A, any time a police officer talks to you? No takers. Okay. What about B, as soon as you're arrested? Okay, few takers. What about C, before or as soon as you arrive at the police station? Okay. Before a cop interrogates you? Or E, before a cop interrogates you and you are not free to leave? There you go. Got to wait for that last one, right? It kind of sounds like the right answer. Absolutely. Um, e is the right answer. So before a cop interrogates you and you are not free to leave. Um, and what this is called is custodial interrogation. And both of those things have to be present for your Miranda warnings to be required. Um, so even if the police just walk up to you on the street um, and you can walk away from them, they don't have to give, they don't have to read you your Miranda rights. Or even if um, you're arrested, but they are not asking you any questions, they don't have to read you your Miranda rights. It's only when there's some kind of interrogation. And we're gonna talk um, a lot more specifically about what custody means and what interrogation means. Um, same thing, like let's say, you know, let's say you get arrested, but if the cops don't need a confession from you, they have all this other evidence, you may never hear your Miranda rights if they don't want to interrogate you. So this is an important thing to remember, and I think um, it's kind of a common misconception that, you know, as soon as the police arrest you, you have to be read your Miranda rights, but you don't. So, you know, these are just some kind of things uh, to remember to make sure you can protect yourself. Um, so how do you know if you're in custody? What does it mean to be in custody? So the technical definition of custody is when a reasonable person in that suspect's position would not feel free to leave. So um, you don't have to be arrested to be in custody, you just can't leave, or you have to feel like you can't leave. Um, 
So what, what do the courts look at to determine if someone was in custody? So there's a few hallmarks that we look for. One, um, are the hallmarks of an arrest present? So even if you weren't like technically under arrest, and we'll talk more specifically about that, are you in an arrest type situation? Uh, where is the interrogation taking place? Um, is it at your home? Do you feel like you could just walk away? Is it on the street where you can turn around and run? Um, or is it in the police station where you're in an interrogation room? And there's, you know, that's going to kind of lead towards the fact that you might be in custody. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the courts are also going to look at, is the investigation focused solely on you? So, you know, you're talking to the police and they know that you're the suspect and they're trying to get something out of you, right? They don't want you to leave. So they're, these are all the factors that add into this. And courts are also going to look at how long have you been questioned for to see if you are in custody. If you're questioned for five minutes, you probably weren't in custody. If you're questioned for, you know, four, five, six hours, you might be leaning more towards you're not free to leave. And I promise I'd talk more about what the hallmarks of arrest are. So what do you guys think are some of the hallmarks of arrest? Um, what, what do you think kind of shows that you've been arrested? Yeah? If you're um, in an interrogation room and they leave you in there and go out and close the door behind you. Sure, that, that might be one of them. Um, but maybe if there's a lot, you know, a lot of police around you. Um, maybe um, they're using all kinds of strong arm tactics or really intense questioning. Um, if they tell you you're not free to leave, right? If they say to you, you can't go, um, then this is a you know, hallmark of arrest. Um, if they tell you the questioning is involuntary, they say you have to answer my questions, then you're gonna start to feel like you may, might be under arrest, that so you're in a custody situation. Um, also, courts are going to look at um, what happened at the end of the conversation with the police. Was the suspect arrested or did they let him go? Um, if you're arrested, like, you know, you're actually arrested at the end, then you're probably in kind of like an arrest type situation where you're not going to be able to leave. What about at school? Um, do you guys think that if you're questioned by the police at school, that's a custody situation. You feel like you're free to leave when you're at school? No. <laughs> no, not at all, right? You're kind of stuck there. You can't really leave. So if the police come to question you while you're at school, um, that's usually considered a custody situation. So that's the first part of uh, Miranda and whether uh, your Miranda rights have to be read is are you in a custody situation? So if police officers come to you at school and they interrogate you, then they probably should have read you your Miranda rights. So how do you know if you are being interrogated? So interrogation means an explicit, explicit questions or actions that are reasonably likely to elicit an incriminating response. Um, so I'm gonna give you a situation. You tell me if you guys think this is an interrogation. If a police officer asks your name, birth date, and address, is this an interrogation? No. Absolutely not. Um, or I would say usually no, right? Most of the time, no. Why not? It's, just, it's, not, it's usually not going to lead to something incriminating, right? So if the police officer stops you and just says, hey, where do you live? that's not necessarily going to end you, you know, end up with you going to jail or end up with you, you know, being convicted of a crime. Um, but let's say um, you are an undocumented immigrant and a police officer comes up to you and says, what's your name, your address, and your birth date? That might be more of a situation where it's an interrogation because your um, answers to that could lead to some kind of incrimination. So for the most part, it's usually um, not an interrogation, but I think you guys are kind of catching on. What does it mean to be interrogated? What about um, if a police asks you if you consent to a search? Is that an interrogation if the police officer just says, can I search you? No, that's not an interrogation either. 
Um, that's just a simple question. You can always say no. Well, most of the time you can say no. Um, and that is not considered an interrogation where your Miranda rights would have to be read to you. Um, and it's not just explicit questions that will constitute interrogation. It's also what we call the functional equivalent of interrogation. So I'm going to give you a scenario and you guys tell me what you think. If a police officer um, said to a handcuffed guy, he's sitting in the um, interrogation room at, uh, sitting in a room, <laughs> sitting in a room at the police station, and a police officer said to him, uh, shut up, don't say anything, uh, when I'm through, you can talk. And then the police officer said all kinds of facts about a homicide that he thinks the uh, individual had committed. And then eventually this individual just started talking and started confessing and saying all these things. Do you think he needed to, uh, you think that was an interrogation situation? Actually, Nevada Supreme Court said yes, that is an interrogation situation because that is the functional equivalent. So the guy felt like, um, you know, he's really kind of in a situation, even though he wasn't asked explicit questions, um, where it was likely to elicit an incriminating response. So um, sometimes it's not as clear cut as just a question. So we have to remember there are two things that are required, uh, basically two things that are required before your Miranda rights have to be read to you. One uh, was their custody. And custody means what? Would a reasonable person feel like they're free to leave? And two, uh, was there an interrogation? Was there direct questioning? Was there a functional equivalent questioning um, where you're expected to get some kind of uh, incriminating response? And remember, you have to have both. So let's say the police like arrest you, right? So the police are arresting you, you're certainly in custody then, but there's no interrogation. Do you have to get your Miranda rights read too? No, it's not required. What if um, you know they stop you on the street and they're asking you all kinds of questions, but they say that you're free to leave? Do they have to read you your Miranda rights? No, they don't. Good job. Exactly. Um, let's talk for a second about what if you're questioned by someone other than the police? Do your Miranda rights have to be read to you? Um, what about like a security guard or a supervisor? So let's say there's a situation, there's a slot machine guy um, and he's running a whole scam or he's rigging the slot machines at one of the casinos. And one of the security, uh, security guys at the casino walks up to him and says, you've got to come back with me to management. And he walks the slot machine guy back there and he has to talk to you know management and then he confesses. Was he supposed to have his Miranda rights read to him? No, right? Um, the Nevada Supreme Court said no. This is not a situation where someone is actually working for the police. It's not a custody situation. So unfortunately, this guy is out of luck and his confession can be used against him. What about if you're in prison and you have a corrections officer asking you questions? Do you have to have your Miranda rights read to you? Yes most of the time that you do um, because this the Supreme Court has also held here that this is a custody situation their corrections officers or agents of the police um, and you do uh, what about if you're in school what about if your school like let's say one of your teachers asks you starts asking you some questions and you start to get a little nervous um, what do you guys think? Do you think that if it's just your teacher asking you questions, your Miranda rights have to be read to you? No. So most of the time, if it's just your teacher, unfortunately, no Miranda rights are afforded to you. However, uh, there is kind of an interesting situation that happened recently uh, where your Miranda rights do have to be read to you by your teacher. So actually in Kentucky, a high school teacher found this empty prescription bottle um, on a bathroom floor, the assistant principal and this deputy sheriff who worked at the school um, saw the name on the bottle and uh, they started questioning the student without his Miranda rights. And then this student admitted there's his prescription and he got in trouble and he was arrested. So in this particular situation, the court found that yes, actually this student needed to have his Miranda rights read to him 
because the school staff wasn't working on their own. They were working in conjunction with the police. So in that particular situation, they yes, they needed to have their Miranda rights read to them. So if your teacher's working on their own and they just find you doing something bad, no Miranda rights. But if they're working in conjunction with the police, um, then usually you would have to have your rights read to you. So now that we know all about our rights, how do we invoke them? How do we use them? What do we do to make sure that we are protected? Um, so you're in a custody situation, you're being interrogated. There are two things that you can do. You can invoke your rights or you can waive them. Um, the first way you, to invoke them um, is, well, the way, best way to invoke them is to say specifically that you are invoking them. So there's two rights associated with Miranda, right? The first one is the right to be silent, and the second one is the right to an attorney. And you want to say them both very specifically. And I think we talked about this in the other presentation. It's really important that you say that, especially uh, for the silence. So you've got to say out loud, I want to invoke my right to silence. Seems kind of silly because then you're speaking, um, but you have to do that. And you've got to do that because the court decisions that we, talk, uh, that we talked about before said that if you don't invoke them, then uh, if you don't say that, then you haven't invoked that. And then you're, uh, the fact that you're silent can be used against you in that capacity. So it's important that you say, I don't want to talk to you. Um, and it's also really important that you say, I want an attorney. And you want to say both of these things immediately. If you want, usually, well, we can talk about uh, invoking it later on, but at the beginning, you usually want to invoke them as soon as possible. I want to stay silent and I want an attorney. It's really important that it's not ambiguous or equivocal. If it is, sometimes the court will say, well, I don't know, they maybe didn't really want an attorney. Um, so things that don't invoke the right, so this is out of a case in Nevada. Um, the guy said, maybe I need to talk to a lawyer instead of you right now, because they could help me out more. Do you guys think that invoked the right to an attorney? No, right? That's just kind of equivocal, he's talking about it. So this guy, he's not gonna get an attorney and he's gonna keep getting questioned by the police. But if you say, something like, when can I talk to a lawyer? Or I need an attorney, or can I get an attorney? Or just give me an attorney, I want an attorney I'm invoking my right. All of those things will um, get you an attorney. So now you guys know how to invoke your rights. What if you wanna to talk to the police? What if you wanna waive your rights? Um, all you really have to do is just talk to the police. So by talking to the police, not asking for an attorney, you've waived your rights. Um, but what's important is you can still invoke them at any time. So let's say you know, you're know you in a custody situation and the police are talking to you and you haven't said anything about invoking your rights and then it's questioning starts to get weird and you're like, ooh. And then you ask for an attorney and then you say, I don't wanna to talk to you anymore, I'm invoking my right to be silent. That's totally okay, you can absolutely do that. Um, anything you've said before that is still fair game, but after that, now your rights are invoked. So even if you didn't say it at the beginning, don't feel scared that like, oh, I forgot. Um, you can always say it at any time. Um, and especially for juveniles, courts are gonna, if you waive them, right? So let's say you go and you waive your rights. Um, courts are always going to look very specifically at the factual situations if a juvenile has waived their rights, especially if his parent isn't there. So um, they're gonna look at things like um, your age, your education level, um, your emotional characteristics, whether the juvenile had any experience with the criminal justice system, um, the length of questioning, time of day, is it really late at night and you're tired and you don't really know what's going on, um, whether a parent was there. So all these things are really gonna add up to whether or not this person effectively waived their rights. Um, and we talked about the making a murderer earlier. And you guys remember, do you guys, you guys watch that? And the confession. So when that guy was sitting, the cousin was sitting in the room, and you know, he was a juvenile, he's sitting there alone, maybe, maybe wasn't um, as intelligent, he was, um, you know, young, he wasn't really educated. All of these factors should come in as to whether 
his confession or his statements were voluntary. Um, so let's say you invoke. So now you tell the police, stop questioning me. Don't talk to me anymore. Um, what are the police supposed to do? They are supposed to stop questioning you until your lawyer arrives. Um, they can't ask you any questions. They can't talk to you anymore. It's done. Um, so as soon as you say that, everything should stop. Um, what happens if the police fail to give you Miranda rights when they were required? What, what's the consequence of that? So let's say you're in a situation, a custodial interrogation situation, and your Miranda rights were supposed to be read to you. They weren't, and then you confessed. What usually happens? Um, yeah? Can't the case be thrown out pretty much because everything they confessed to didn't really help because the Miranda rights weren't today. So yeah, you're on the right track there. So what's going to be thrown out is the confession normally. So not the whole case, but the confession. And sometimes the confession is the whole case. So then if that's it, then you're done and you're free. Um, but um, you cannot have any statement that was, you, any statement you made, any confession you made, anything used against you if it was made in violation of your Miranda rights. Um, and I'll just read you the text from Miranda v. Arizona, which I think is important. Um, so the prosecution may not use statements, whether exculpatory or inculpatory, stemming from custodial interrogation of the defendant unless it demonstrates the use of procedural safeguards effective to secure the privileged against self-incrimination. So that kind of wraps it up, right? That's really what it's all about. Um, so. Let's walk through a couple of scenarios to just kind of to show you a little bit more about how Miranda rights work in practice, and then we'll finish up with some other rights. Um, so here is this guy, Mr. Perkins. He's sitting in jail after being arrested for committing a crime, and he's got this fellow cell block guy in jail with him. And the, the guy talks to him, Mr. Perkins, and says, hey, have you ever committed a robbery? He's talking to him about it. And Mr. Perkins says, yeah, and talks about this robbery he committed, and he says all these things. Um, but it turns out that his cell block buddy is an undercover cop. So what do you guys think? Was Mr. Perkins required to be advised of his Miranda rights in this situation? And there's actually two answers here, depending on what court you're in. So what do you guys think? Did he have to have his Miranda rights read to him? Yes, no, both of them. Well, they're both right. So it just depends what court you're in. So if you are under operating under Nevada state law, then uh, yes, he did have to have his Miranda rights read to him. And um, what the Nevada Supreme Court said was this, um, it's a disapproved practice for an inmate in law enforcement to strike an agreement where the inmate is placed with an accused and they solicit information to be used against the accused. Um, and they said that this is a suspect who's in custody and he's being questioned by an agent of the police and he was subject to interrogation. So the Nevada Supreme Court said no undercover interrogations in the jail cell. But the federal court said no, this guy does not have to have his Miranda rights read to him and the confession can be used against him. So this is why it's really important to know your rights. Um, there are different, different places and it just kind of depends what the situation is. Um, so what about this scenario? guy Robert he's driving really fast on the street he's going 40 miles an hour in a 25 mile per hour zone and he sees the flashing red lights in the rearview mirror and the cop pulls him over and the cop comes up to him he says step out of the car he talks to him he says Robert do you know how fast you were going and he said yeah I was speeding I'm really sorry and then uh, Robert gets a ticket um, was Robert required to be advised of his Miranda rights in this situation no, right? Has anyone been uh, read their Miranda rights when they got a ticket? No. Um, you do not have to have your Miranda rights read to you. Um, and what the Supreme Court has said about this is it's a non-coercive atmosphere, right? It's just kind of like an ordinary traffic stop. Remember we talked about all the kinds of different things that would make up custody. It's just a few minutes. Usually you're in and out of there pretty quickly. Uh, you're temporarily detained. You're in the view of the public most of the time, so it's not custody, and your Miranda rights don't have to be read to you. And this is our last scenario. Um, so 
let's say this woman, she runs up to the police and she had just been assaulted by a man carrying a gun. She describes her attacker, she says this is exactly what he looks like, and she said, oh, he just ran into this grocery store. The police run into the grocery store, they see the man matching his description, and they say, stop. They tell this guy to stop, he stops. Um, you know, they look at him, they handcuff him, and they see he has a gun holster, but he has no gun in his holster. And so the cops, before they Mirandize him or do anything, say, where's your gun? And the guy says, oh, it's over there. <laughs> and so that's a confession. Um, should the suspect have been advised of his Miranda rights? No. Why not? This is, yeah. An emergency situation? Yeah, it's a public safety exception, exactly. So this is the what we call, yes, the public safety exception to the Miranda requirement. Um, so even though he meets all the hallmarks of uh, Miranda, which is what you need to be in custody and being interrogated, um, the Supreme Court said that their need for answers in a situation posing a threat to public safety outweighs the need for the Miranda rule. So um, as you guys can see, sometimes applies sometimes it doesn't so it's important to know um, when these rights affect you and what you can do so now I want to just talk to you about a few rights that also are kind of are applicable to school and uh, kind of uh, work into all of this too um, which are your rights against search and seizure while you are in school um, and just really quickly to give you the background outside of school you have all the same rights as everyone else right um, the police can't search you without a warrant based on probable cause unless it falls into one of these several exceptions. Um, and those include arrest, um, consent, uh, plain view, uh, some kind of stop and frisk situation, an emergency. Um, so you have all of those rights normally. But what if you're inside of school? Um, can a teacher search you when you're in school, let's say, um, a teacher thinks that you um, has a reasonable suspicion that there are drugs in your backpack. Can the teacher ask you to step outside and look in your backpack? Yes. Thank you. Can you distinguish the teachers from administrators? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes. So the school can search you if they have a reasonable suspicion um, that they might uncover evidence that you violated some kind of school rule the search still has to be reasonable so they can't um, you know make you come to the front of the class and like strip search you in front of everyone um, and that has to still be based on something reasonable um, and they have to have an individualized suspicion about you so um, what they have to think is, you know, that they know something about you. They can't just say, I heard that there's drugs being sold and then search everybody's bags. So what they have to have is some kind of special suspicion or um, specific people that they want to search. What about police searches at school? Can the police come into school and just um, search everyone without a warrant? No, right? Um, the same restrictions still apply um, when the police come into your school. They still, um, and I'm going to say most of the time, because sometimes there's exceptions, but um, the police need a warrant to search your stuff. Um, and the last one is, what about drug tests? So the Fourth Amendment generally protects people against suspicionless, suspicionless searches. Um, and what can the, uh, can the school test anyone they want for drugs? No. But if you are um, a member of, let's say, like the swim team, can they make it a condition that they drug test you? Yes, they can. Um, and the Supreme Court said that these are voluntary extracurricular activities and that this can be a requirement. Um, so that's kind of a, a quick overview of just your rights, search and seizure when you're in school. And I want to leave you with just some general tips about what to do if you are stopped by law enforcement. Um, in general, you know, be calm, be polite, um, don't interfere or obstruct with anything, um, don't resist the police, don't lie or give false documents. Um, uh, remember what happened also, so make sure uh, you know the officer's name, you know if there are any witnesses, pay attention to your surroundings, um, 
and if you feel that your rights have been violated, do file a complaint. Um, you know, you can always come to the ACLU and <laughs> talk to us. Um, but you know, you want to still uh, make sure you know about what everything that's going on. And it's important to always ask the police, are you free to leave? Right? Um, and you can always ask them politely and nicely, am I free to leave? And they, they can tell you. Um, and then you can see how all of this works into your rights um, and whether you're in a custodial situation or not. And you can also almost, mo well most of the time say, you don't consent to any searches, right? So if you haven't been arrested and they're just talking to you, you can say, I don't want anything to be searched and they can't search it without a warrant. Um, and the last thing and the most important thing to remember is to always affirmatively state two things. What's the first one? You're exercising your right to silence, silence and you want, perfect, good job guys. All right, so that's, that's it. Any questions? Yeah. And what type of case would you want to waive your your Miranda rights? Well, <laughs> I mean, my my personal view is never. Um, you know, like I I would say that almost all of the time you're going to want to wait, um, get an attorney, and get someone there to help you. Um, it can't be used against you if you say it specifically. At the beginning, I'm invoking my right to be <coughs> silent and I want an attorney. Um, you know, maybe it makes the cops a little bit upset, but these are your constitutional rights and you're entitled to them and you should invoke them. Um, but I, I suppose that's a personal decision, but my advice to you is always. Yeah. All right, um, when you first started your speech, you were talking about how um, when you were questioning the juvenile and interrogating them, the parents can either be or they don't have to wait for them. No. Yeah. In sense, in most cases, when parents are in the thing, when the juveniles are being questioned, it like affects their answers. Can is it? Or, can the officers like make the parents wait outside, or is it just a thing that it's up to the parents if they want to be in there or not? It's up to the officer, actually. It's not up to the parent. So the parent has to be notified, but they don't have to be in there. Um, the cop can, I, and you know, they might want the parent to be in there because remember, these are one of the things that they're going to look at if um, the confession or the statements were voluntary or not. Um, you know, does was the parent in the room? Like, were they there to help them? Um, so it just kind of depends on the situation. But no, they don't have to be in the room. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you were saying that um, you know how um, when you invoke your rights, right? Um, what if the police ask you like, "Oh, do you want some water?" Or like that? Isn't that the same thing as asking a question? Or, or well, like so remember, an interrogation is a question that's likely to elicit some kind of response that's going to incriminate you. So, under most circumstances, I would say asking if somebody wants some water is not going to incriminate you. Um, although, I suppose if like. I don't know. I mean, if you were like on drugs and they showed somehow you're really thirsty and you want water, they might use that or something. But, um, you know, that's kind of one of the things to keep in mind if it's you know, like an interrogation. Yeah. <clears throat> Can I talk with my lawyer on the phone in the present time when police uh, have intention to arrest me and how the lawyer can help me on the phone? Uh, sure. So, um, you're asking, are you allowed to call your lawyer if yeah, after you've been arrested? Yeah, to arrest me, and I say, I want to talk with my lawyer, and say, okay, talk with your lawyer, and I say, may I call my lawyer? Can I do that? Well, I mean, it's going to depend probably like on the police um, and what they're going to allow you to do. Um, I'd also say to keep in mind that a lot of times, I mean, especially if you're not using your cell phone, a lot of times calls or listened to, um, especially like if you're in the jail, your calls are going to be listened to almost all of the time. Even if, um, even if it's an attorney, sometimes it just depends on the situation. So, you know, you're gonna, you can say, I want to talk to my attorney on the phone. You can try to do that, and the cops may let you do that. But they might also think you're just gonna call someone else. You know, you're gonna call your co-defendant and say, like, you know, hide all, the, hide all the drugs or something, and try to get rid of it. So. Arresting me in the street and uh, telling me the Miranda rights. Uh, I, so I can request to speak with my attorney in present time, right now. Right. Can you keep so, Tom, so, you can, 
So I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. If you're on the street and you... I don't see the police facing danger, arresting me in the present time, you know, mm -hmm. without explanation, and telling me the Miranda rights. So, and I say, okay, uh, I would like to call my lawyer right now. Okay. I'm allowed to do that? Can't he say no? Well, no, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it's going to be like if you've been just arrested and you have your cell phone with you and you say, I want to call my attorney um, at that particular time, you can like you can call your attorney. You can see if the cop's going to let you do that. <coughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, also added to what you were saying about when you're arrested, you have to remain calm and comply. Another thing also that I learned because I'm a uh, police volunteer. Uh, is to always show your hands. Don't, sure. put them, don't put them in your pocket or in your purse or because, or you don't move because they don't know their life is on their hand and you don't know what you're going to be getting, reaching for. So always show your hands, you know, either on the steering wheel or wherever they see them. Yes, that's very good advice too. Keep your hands clear so they know you're not reaching for something. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to the ACLU? Sure. Um, sure. I um, went to law school in Virginia and then I came um, to Nevada and I practiced plaintiff's employment law for a while, um, which is uh, when you're representing people who are discriminated against, who've been harassed at work. Um, I did a lot of federal court work with that um, and was just generally involved with the community, with other like social justice, uh, socially active organizations. And um, then I decided I wanted to make the career switch to the ACLU. It's just a really amazing organization. Um, you know, obviously throughout history, they've made um, really huge impacts on civil rights and really are defenders of liberty. So, um, and then I guess that's, that's it, I am. Yeah. Do you just consult with your clients or do you go and represent them in court? Oh, I represent them in court. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I'll kind of explain to you how the ACLU works. So, uh, we are, like I said, we're a nonprofit organization. We do all kinds of stuff, we're, but we're also a law firm. So, we have what we call um, integrated advocacy is the best way to explain it. So, what we do a lot of times is start with seeing what we can do on an advocacy level. So we have a full-time policy director who's also an attorney um, and a lobbyist, and she tries, and we together try to, you know, do things by like, you know, talking to different government officials, meeting with people, um, doing public education campaigns, and just doing general like advocacy on issues. And if that doesn't work, uh, then we sue. So uh, that's when I come in, and then I'll file a lawsuit. Um, but we also do just, you know, if someone just comes to me with a complaint, maybe there's no room for advocacy, and we just file a lawsuit. So um, there's all kinds of different aspects to it. Yeah. Uh, what are like the minimal requirements to be that? Like that you see helping? Sure. Sure. Um, well, I think one of the most important requirements is to demonstrate a desire for social justice and for uh, protecting civil rights and civil liberties. And I think if you're interested in this kind of work and this is something you want to do, uh, you know, I would try to start exploring internships uh, with the ACLU. You can definitely contact us. We certainly have interns um, in high school, in college, in law school. Um, so if you're interested in that, I'd recommend that. And there's many other organizations where you can start volunteering, donating your time, and just kind of seeing how that world works. And the more you know about it, the more that you can demonstrate this is a passion of yours, um, the easier it is to kind of make that transition. Yeah. What is ACLU stand for? Sure. It is the American Civil Liberties Union. Any other questions? Yeah. Can you talk about any of the types of cases you're dealing with right now? Sure. Um, so one kind of interesting case we're dealing with um, is a violation of the Nevada Voter or the National Voter Registration Act, um, which is a federal law that requires every state to have certain um, processes in place that make, sh make it easier for people to vote. So um, if you go to the DMV, you're supposed to be able to register to vote almost simultaneously when you sign up for a license or an ID card or something like that. Um, same thing with like social services agencies. 
um, and there are all manner of other requirements that states are supposed to do just to make it easier to get people to vote. Um, and unfortunately, Nevada is not um, compliant uh, with that. So we actually are engaging in advocacy right now uh, with some of the government officials we sent what's called a notice letter, and that's required under the statute where we kind of lay out all the violations for them, and we say, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is what you're doing wrong, this is what you're doing wrong, you have 90 days to fix it or we're gonna sue you. Um, and so they very kindly are talking to us, and uh, we're trying to figure out a way to fix it to make it easier for everyone to register to vote, which is actually obviously a very important right in and of itself, but then this year is extra important because obviously we have a presidential election coming up and it's important that uh, as many people register to vote as can. Um, so that's kind of one of the things we're working on. We also um, are doing some work in the um, social, uh, in the criminal justice reform areas as well. Uh, we just, uh, last session, worked really hard to pass a bill uh, that ended juvenile life without parole which means that um, juveniles, if you're convicted of a crime as you committed as a juvenile, then you can't be sentenced to life without parole, and you have to be guaranteed a parole hearing after a certain number of years, depending on what crime you committed and um, kind of other circumstances. So that's some of the other stuff we're working on, and actually we have a presentation every Friday at the Clark County Law Library right over here, uh, where we educate people about how to restore their civil rights after they've been convicted of a crime. So uh, once you are convicted of a felony, uh, depending on what kind of felony you were convicted of, you lose your right to vote, you lose your right to sit on a jury, you lose your right to run for office um, forever. So we kind of teach people how to get those rights back as well. Um, and it just kind of runs, runs the gamut of all the work that we do. I can keep talking about work if you guys want to know. <laughs> Anything, any other questions about Miranda, your rights, ACLU? Cool. Okay, thank you guys very much. We appreciate it.